Now, when most people get started with their smart home setup, the first thing they typically do is set up LED lights. Now, one of the most popular styles of LED lights are the LED strip. A lot of people use these to add lighting under counters, in their bedrooms, or even in their office. Now, I've used quite a few brands of LED strips and even reviewed a few right here on this channel. But if you've ever been interested in making your own custom lighting with LED strips, Today's project is just for you. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at a project called WLED. This project was designed specifically for setting up a variety of LED strips and being able to customize them to your heart's content. Hello everyone, it's Ryan with The Smart House. So we're gonna be taking a look at a very popular open source LED controller project called WLED. This is a project that will allow you to create your own custom LED lights using a variety of different styles and shapes of LED strips. Now here in a second, we'll talk about what this project is and how it's used. But I've decided to do something a little bit different for this video. I'm actually gonna split it into two separate parts because it's hard enough to get people to watch a 15 minute video they sure as heck won't watch one that's 30 minutes long. The first part, which is today's video, will have to do with the hardware. So we're gonna talk about the requirements, how to assemble everything, and connect your LEDs. Then on the next video, which will probably come at the tail end of this week, we'll take a look at the WLED software and how to get it all set up and running, and also how to integrate it with Home Assistant. So you don't wanna miss that video, and you can find a link down in the description once it's available. I've actually been playing with WLED for quite some time. I used it back here on my office desk light project. This started off as a project just to create my own custom down lights under my monitors, but it's involved into a full amber light for the desktop Top computer. One of the coolest things about the WLED project is you can connect it with a Hyperion app. So if you remember my video on creating a custom Ambilight using the Hyperion project, you remember that we could add LEDs around a TV and have it react to incoming HDMI signals like a set-top box, Blu-ray player, or Xbox. But similar to that, you can run the Hyperion software on your computer and have it output colors to the attached LED strips to match what's on screen. Now that's pretty cool. Now you may have noticed the different setup in here. We've been moving my office into a new room in the house. That means no more bed in the background and room for so many more activities. Look at your robots in here. So many activities. Now I started filming this video a few weeks ago, so you might notice some shots in the old office. Speaking of which, so you may be asking yourself, what is WLED? Well, WLED is an open source project that allows you to control the NeoPixel based LED lights. These are also known as the WS2812 series of lights. It's either powered by an ESP8266 or an ESP32 based microcontroller. It's a fast and powerful project preloaded with numerous presets and effects. There are also various forks and plugins, including a version that supports sound based inputs via a microphone. That project allows the ESP to react to sounds and music so that way it updates the lights and presets. So currently I'm using WLED to power my desk and monitor lights that are behind me. And for this project, we're gonna be setting up the LED lights on my 3D printer. Now, if you watched my previous videos on my 3D printer, you'll know that I've actually already set up the LED lights on there to display the status and also to light up for the camera. But those were directly connected to the Pi using the GPIO pins. Due to some damage or issues with the GPIO pins on my older Raspberry Pi 3, I have to switch over to a dedicated microcontroller. I'd replace the Pi, but it's so hard to find them right now. Now, for LED projects, I also use the ESP Home project which this one is owned and operated by the Home Assistant team. So if you remember, a few months ago, I did a video on an office status light to let my family know when I'm in a meeting or recording. That was actually based on the ESP Home project. So you might be wondering what the difference between these two projects are, as they're both ESP32 based projects and they support NeoPixels. Well, as I understand it, if you want just LEDs with limited inputs, buttons, etc., and you want a large suite of effects, then you'll want to choose the WLED project. However, if you want a variety of sensors and other outputs in a single project on one microcontroller, and you want to throw some LEDs LEDs on there for notification, then you probably want to choose ESP Home. So before we get into the requirements, real quick, I want to give you guys a tip if you want to make this whole project a lot easier. So this week, I've partnered with PCBWay, and I'm proud to introduce my first version of the WLED PCB. Now this is a very simple PCB board that I designed specifically to use for a WLED project. It's very simplistic and very basic, but it was an opportunity to get my circuit design skills back up and running. Now, PCBWay reached out to me a few months ago about collaborating on a project, and they did provide these boards free of charge. So a big thank you to PCBWay for providing the boards for this project. Now, of course, you can accomplish this entire project without the PCB because it is a very simple circuit. But one of the problems I've ran into is wiring in a lot of the power LEDs and resistors. It tends to cause a bit of a mess. This is what it looks like if you don't use the PCB. This is an example of a proto board that turned out really messy because I'm terrible with proto boards and not very good at soldering. It also had a couple of shorts in the circuit. So occasionally when the board warms up, I would lose some of the lights behind my monitor. The only way really to fix this was percussive maintenance. So if you'd like to shortcut this project, you can go ahead and pick up a five pack of these PCBs from PCBWay down below. It comes in a five pack because that's the minimum size for this particular project, but you can use the extra boards on future projects. So I designed everything on the board for through hole because I figured it would be easier for most people to solder. Optionally, you can add in things like terminals to make testing easier. And if any of you out there are electrical engineers and want to nitpick my design, please feel free to. 
I'd be happy to post the ECAD files on my blog post. If you'd like to attempt this without the PCB, I do have a wiring diagram available in the blog post for this video, which you can get in the description or by going to this link here on screen. And of course, everything on the hardware list can be had from Amazon. You can also order them from AliExpress if you want to save a little money and don't mind waiting. So for the first major item in the requirements list, we need a Node MCU ESP8266 development. Now I based my PCB design off this particular board because it's ubiquitous, inexpensive, plus I had a bunch of them lying around. Now note, the WLED project supports both the ESP8266 and the newer ESP32 type boards. So if you have any of those lying around from my ESP Presence project, you can use them as well, but not with the PCB. I will probably make a version two of the PCB to support the ESP32. So keep an eye on that blog post for future updates on the PCB. I feel like I'm saying PCB a lot. So the next most important thing you're gonna need for hardware is a roll of LED strips. Now I'm using the WS2812B strips, which are in the family with the trade name of NeoPixel. These simple five volt LED strips can be driven off of the onboard power supply if you're only using a couple. And if you remember, I used these in the office status light video also in the Hyperion video. Now these come in three different pixel densities, meaning how many pixels per meter, so you have some options depending on how bright you want your setup. In addition, you can buy them both IP30 rated, which does not have any coating on them, or IP67 rating, which has a waterproof coating over the LEDs and the strips. Now for my 3D printer, I've used the 144 LED per meter, super dense version of these strips so I can have extra bright light over the bed of the printer. But please note, these are the most difficult to solder because the pads are small and close to the circuit components on the strips. Now for the monitor to desk light behind me, I'm using a combination of the 100 LED per meter on the bottom with the 60 LED per meter on the sides and back. So just design out what you wanna use for the project and then select the proper densities for your LEDs. Now this is a trade-off because obviously the higher density LEDs are more expensive, plus they consume more power. So just depending on the project, you need to design out how much light output you want versus the amount of power consumed. Now, on the subject of the number of LEDs of hardware is your power supply. Now you can use the following calculation to approximate how many watts you're gonna need for your LED strips. If we take 60 milliamps and we multiply it by the number of LEDs total for the project times five volts, that yields the minimum power supply needed. And then go ahead and round this up. On that subject, there's a handy calculator built into the WLED dashboard that you can use to check that you have enough wattage for your project. So these power supplies come in a couple different form factors. If this is a small project, you can go ahead and probably use a wall wart, which will provide you somewhere in the neighborhood of four amps or 20 watts. If you have a larger project, like what I've got back here or my Hyperion project, I use one of the larger metal frame power supplies that can go up to hundreds of watts. So feel free to select a slightly larger power supply to make sure you have enough headroom and you don't run into any problems with brownouts or color distortion because you don't have enough power. So next, of course, we're gonna need some resistors to help regulate our LEDs. Now for the NeoPixels, they recommend anywhere between 200 ohm and 500 ohm resistors. Classically, I've used the 470 ohm resistors, but you can use whatever you have lying around as long as it's in the proper range. Now, everyone remembers the resistor color codes from circuit class, right? Me neither. Just Google if you need to. So of course, we're gonna be doing some soldering today. So we need a decent iron. If you're looking for a recommendation, I use the TS100 based irons. They're a little on the pricey side, but they're super compact and can run off of a variety of power supplies. You can also modify them to run off of drill and RC batteries. It's also helpful to have a set of helping hands, arms that you can use to hold your project into place while you're soldering so you don't burn your fingers. I've done that way too many times. Finally, you're gonna need some various terminals and other accessories. I like to use the female terminals that come with the Node MCU and solder those directly to the board so it's much easier to swap out a damaged microcontroller if you fry it for some reason. And if you're using my PCB, you're gonna need some two pole screw down terminal blocks for the power supply. Then for the LED connectors, you can either use some scrap mail headers if you have them or you can solder directly onto the board. Now it's also a good idea to have some wire lying around. I like these little multicolor packs that you can pick up off of Amazon that have pre-tinned lead wire in them. It's super convenient. You just pull out how much you need and clip it off, and then you've got a variety of colors as well. Now, if you're not gonna be using one continuous length of LED strip, and you wanna customize the length, or you need to make gaps, then you're gonna need a way of interconnecting the strips. If you're confident in soldering, you can go ahead and solder some lead wire to the strips, and then interconnect them that way. But if you're new to soldering, those pads are a little small, and sometimes can be easy to burn off. If you do decide to solder, Make sure you tin your wires and your pads before attempting to connect. This makes it so much easier so you don't risk burning out your LEDs or burning off the pads. If you don't wanna mess with the soldering on the LED strips, you can also pick up a variety of LED connectors from Amazon. I like these clear connectors that you can insert the lead wire on one end and then tap onto the LED strips with the other. They also make these slide on connectors that work pretty well, but I've had some problems with alignment. These kits even come with some flexible 90 degree pieces to make your corners super clean. All right, with the requirements out of the way, 
Let's get started on the project. So our first step with the assembly is to attach the headers to our board. Again, these are optional, but they do make replacing a bad or damaged PCB a lot easier. You can use any size of these and link them together, but be sure to check your fit before you solder. One tip is to tack down the first pin with solder and then you can flip the board over and finish without the headers falling out. Now I have my iron set to 300 degrees Celsius for this and I'm just using the standard flux solder. You need to make sure that the header sits flat and straight on the board. Don't worry about the length of the pins on the back, we'll trim them later. Now if you don't have a set of headers that fit exactly on the board, then you can cut them with a pair of diagonal cutters. Just make sure not to damage the contact you need. Now for the LED connections to the board, I'm using male headers. Again, you can use some lead wire to solder directly to the board, but I like using these DuPont style connectors, so I need to have a male header sticking out of the board. These male headers can also be cut with cutters. Be sure to wear safety glasses. Solder this down in the same way. Now we have the headers for the ESP and LEDs. If you want to install more LED outputs, then add more headers to the board. Next, we're going to install the resistors. I still have a bank of resistors from college that I sorted by the first color band, so I'm going to use these 470 ohm resistors. You want to bend the legs of the resistor so you can put them through either slot on the board for each resistor location. Make sure to have the resistor relatively close to the middle between the two pads so you can bend the legs and place it flat along the board. Once you pull the resistor flat to the board, you can solder it down from the back. You'll need one resistor per output to your LEDs. Now you can clip off the excess wires from the resistor. Again, wear safety glasses and do it over a trash can. These things will fly. Next, we need to add our power terminal. This one can be tricky because of the short leads, but flipping the board over on the terminal block helps. Now let's insert our ESP and make sure it fits and you can make contact with each of the terminals. Pay attention to the bottom of the board where it says USB and make sure the micro USB terminal is on this side of the board. Now let's work on the LEDs. I'm taking a small section of some female DuPont connectors that I had and cut them in half. Make sure you know which color is which pin. You don't want to reverse the ground and pause it. Now I really like these LED connectors designed to take lead wire and connect them into an LED strip. So we're going to line up the other side of the DuPont connector with the lead wire side. Again, you want to make sure you match the proper order of the colors for your wire. In my case, the yellow is the five volt pin, the green is data, and the blue is ground. Once you have these inserted, you can press down to have the vampire connectors push through the wire coating. If needed, you can use a pair of pliers to press down until it locks. Then we need to open the LED strip side. A small screwdriver helps here. Now we insert the LED strip end into the connector. Make sure to remove some of the backing from the sticky side of the strip. It helps make it fit. Once you bottom out the strip into the connector, you can press it close, similar to the other side. Now that our LED strips are connected, let's power up the system. So I'm gonna use the included pigtail adapter that came with my power supply. Now we're gonna attach a couple pieces of scrap lead wire to both the pigtail and the terminal on the PCB board. And then once that's complete, we'll go ahead and plug it in and ensure that the microcontroller gets power. All right, so now we have the hardware portion of our build complete. You should have a single LED lit up showing there's power to the LED strips. Now you can go ahead and attach the LED strips to whatever you want to decorate. If you're impatient, you can head over to the WLED project page and flash your ESP to start tinkering with the project. But stick around for part two, where I show you how to flash, configure, and integrate the WLED project. See you then. So you want to look at the, when you're, you, that's why the teleprompter down there so you can look at the people when you're talking to them and then there's my that's actually recording and i can see myself and that's the new